Hey everyone, welcome to Hope Fellowship. Welcome to our online experience. I'm glad you're joining us this weekend. Last weekend, we finished our series on John and our campus pastors did the speaking and they did a great job. So Mike, Aaron, Robert, Eric, way to go. Um, I, I get to work with these guys all the time, but I also get to be their friends and, and just really appreciate them. Uh, my name is Terry Kelly and I'm the lead worship and production pastor here at Hope Fellowship. And what that means is I get to work helping out people who are incredibly talented, incredibly dedicated. And there, if you've been uh, engaged and enjoying our experience online in worship, a lot of that, I mean, most has to do with them. They're just doing, they just do a great job. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself because we're gonna spend a little time together talking about worship. But I, when I graduated from Bible school, I kind of took an unorthodox approach and I uh, joined a band. I actually created a band and was in it for 10 years. And uh, we wrote worship music. We played in front of people. And man, it was an incredible way to, to live life. It's definitely a lifestyle. And uh, that was really awesome. But at the end of it, I felt like God was kind of transforming my heart to be a worship pastor. And so I followed that. And, and I've done that for a lot of years. And it's just been an incredible experience watching people worship. I mean, I have the best seat in the house and I get to see their journeys. I get to help them along with their journeys. It's incredible. Uh, another thing about me is I have five kids and yet you saw all five fingers go up. <clears throat> that, uh, it's not my life plan. It's not many people's life plan to have five kids, but I'm so glad we do. We love those guys and, and it makes life so interesting. One thing I noticed, like when we go to the store, we go to the grocery store, uh, we get out of our minivan. Yes, I am sort of proud owner of a minivan and we kind of spill out and we go to the restaurant or we go to the grocery store or whatever and there's seven of us, there's so many, it's a sea of humanity. And what I've learned is about myself is I like to just get places. But I know if I go at my speed that I'm gonna leave the little four-year-old behind because his little legs won't catch up to mine. And we value going together. And that's a lot like the way we approach worship at Hope. We have some people that, man, when they go for worship, they just go for it, and it's awesome. And as a worship leader, I can speak for all the worship leaders, we love that, it's so fun. But at the same time, there are other people from different backgrounds and different situations where they don't worship quite that way. And there are people who are just dipping their toe into this whole God thing, this whole church and this worship thing. And we value looking at a, through a lens that, that encompasses all of them. And it makes it harder on us, but we like that because it makes it easier on other people to engage. So uh, Jim Gaffigan has this great joke. He talks about uh, five, having five kids is just like having four kids, except you're drowning and somebody throws you a baby. And, and I, I, can, I can attest that sometimes it's like that. Uh, but luckily, fortunately for me, I have an incredible wife named Alicia who, who is very accomplished, teaches, has taught high school. Uh, she took time off to kind of get our kids into kindergarten. And since we kept having kids, that time kept getting extended. And so we're still in that process. Uh, and and in, the, in her free time, she helps people write books. And so she's mega talented. But one of the things that she loves to do is she loves to uh, teach fitness classes and she does it a lot. <clears throat> and that's where we're really, really different is she likes to go to the gym and I tolerate the gym. She likes to be in there and really just get going. Her body speaks to her that she needs water, she needs vegetables. My body always wants pizza and just to not go to the gym. <laughs> and so uh, we're very different that way, but she's always asking me, hey, come to one of my classes, come to one of my classes. And I come and she's really, she's really good at it. But what I do, what I did was, what I, I got in there and I'm kind of an introvert and I'm already know I'm gonna look ridiculous. So I, I get my weights and let me tell you first of all that my, it's weights, it's, uh, it's breathing, it's stretching, it's also steps. So you gotta get all these pieces together. So I camp out in the corner, there's mirrors everywhere. So I'm trying to figure out where the mirror doesn't really catch me. And so I grab my weights, I grab my mat and then I put it all down and then I have to go back and get my steps. And so I turn around and I get my steps and I turn back around and I realize my stuff has been moved to the center of the room, pretty close to it. <clears throat> and I realize that I've taken somebody's spot, the irregular. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was horrified and I did everything. And I was like, I was out of step. Everybody knew I was bad and I was in the middle of the room. And it was really a bad experience and it lasted like an hour. It, it, it was terrible. And, and I think sometimes we, I, I try to remember often, sometimes when people come in for the first time, it's a lot like that, right? Like they see people who know what they're supposed to be doing, know how everything works, where, everything, where to go, every spot. 
And we really want to make room for the first time guest, the first time attender, because, because it's so important that they are comfortable. Why? Because one, we like people. We love people. Man, if people matter to God, they matter to us. But number two, we also think that the worship experience is so important and we want everybody to have an opportunity to engage in worship. So today, uh, we're, gonna talk, we're gonna look at why worship is so important. And to do that, we have to kind of understand God's story and what he's up to throughout the Bible. To do that, you have to look at the Bible. And the Bible is really interesting because it's just a, it's a collection of stories, of songs and wisdom. Psalm is the, Psalms is the biggest book that we have in the Bible and it's a song book. But the stories sometimes are a little troubling for me because I read them and it's just people messing up a lot. And the real story of God is God trying to dwell with his people. He's trying to be with his people. And that word dwell is really important because it's God trying to dwell, make his home, to abide, to be with. He wants to set up life with us. And we continually mess that up. But why does it happen over and over again? It's because of a word that we all know that we hear little kids say all the time. They say, mine. And we know instinctively, that's not right. That's not what we're created for. We're created to say, share, and yours, and ours. But instead, we instinctively, for some reason, say, mine. And that is what gets us out of step. So every time we make ourselves the center of our universe, we find ourselves in the wrong place, and we find ourselves out of tune because we weren't made for ourselves. We are made for more. Okay. I love guitars, and over the years I've collected a few, and I've got a couple over here, and I just want to show you, show you these, not just because not just they're great guitars, I like them, but because um, it's, a, it's a, a little illustration. So you have a guitar that's in tune, and it sounds like this. Sounds great, right? Play it, if I had it upright, play it, it sounds good. It's what it's made for. This guitar is designed to be in tune. It was made for these strings to set a certain way so they would play the songs that the songwriter or the singer, singer and guitar player wants to play. But then we have a guitar that um, our production person, Mark, has, has generously helped me. And it uh, sounds like this. And that's out of tune. And you know immediately, something's not right. It's not, it's not doing what it was made for because we know that this is what it was made for to do that. And so what I want us to look at today is why do we keep getting out of tune? What keeps happening? We want to look at how God dwells with people, how he continues to try to dwell with people and how it gets messed up. And we're going to go with three different spots. We're going to go in the beginning with the garden. We're going to go later on when God says to create a tabernacle where he can live. And we're also going to see where finally man goes, let's make a temple for God. And then it gets messed up. Spoiler alert, it gets messed up all three times. But in the end, there is a solution. There is a final plan that God has, and it's incredible. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do, it all starts in a garden. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. You are so amazing. Uh, we want to really look into your word today and want you to help us to see something really different really unique that you've done, that's your story. God, we don't want to try to get you to follow our story, but we want to figure out how to fit into your story because you're the central character. You're the main character. You're the lead character. And God, we look to you today to help us to get in tune with that by looking back at, at your word and all the ways that it for some reason didn't work out, but help us to know who to look to and how to look to it today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, disclaimer as we start in the garden. Uh, disclaimer is that, hey, this isn't gonna be long and this isn't gonna be super complex. We're gonna go pretty fast. You're, by the end of this, you're gonna go, wow, we went through a lot, a lot of miles together and we will, but it won't feel, you won't feel the mileage. Okay, so we start at the beginning. We see in verse one that God creates heaven and earth, but the real action happens, verse 27, and God gets to where he was going the whole time. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man. Male and female, he created them. Now, I know that may sound a little bit like a Dr. Seuss book, but it's not, it's really important. He's reiterating something that is really important. And one is that God created us, that we come from the, the hand of the creator. 
But the other thing is how unique we are as human beings. He didn't make uh, animals or trees or, or water or the land. He didn't make any of that in his own image. He made us in his own image. And what that means ultimately is that we're a representation, the closest thing to who he is on earth when he's not there. And so it's similar to when like back in the old, in the ancient rulers used to, used to uh, be over a ton of area, different continents, and they couldn't be there at all. But what they would do is in the places they couldn't physically be present, they would, uh, they would make an image. They would make a statue of themselves. And everybody that saw that statue would know that's where that ruler lives. That's where the ruler rules. And so he, all of a sudden, God makes planet. He makes man. Now, the next thing he, he makes well, after this, he makes a garden. And you ever wonder why it's a garden? What, what's that all about? Well, scholars believe that the garden was very temple-like was it was a place where Adam would go with Eve, Adam would go and meet with God, would spend time with God and probably worship God. And the garden only had one rule. And that one rule was don't eat the apple. Now, I don't know why it was an apple. Like if it was a banana, that's more tempting to me. I'm not an apple guy so much. I'll eat an apple, but I'm not excited about it. I'm definitely not gonna throw everything away for an apple. But guess what? They broke the one rule. They ate the apple. And we have to ask ourselves, what for fruit, for, for an apple? That, no, that doesn't make any sense. But here's what it really was all about. It says it in Genesis 3, 4 through 5. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. They'll be like God. They'll take the same spot as God. They were making the story about themselves. They weren't reaching for apple. They were reaching for themselves to be the main character. They were saying, mine. And the strings slip out of tune and they were banished from the garden. God had made them for, themse- for himself, but we are not made for ourselves. So we move on from the garden. That already got messed up. <clears throat> and we, we move into Exodus. And so God doesn't do anything for a long time, anything resembling this garden until we get to the tabernacle. And here's how this all gets set up is Israel was in bondage uh, in Egypt. They had forced labor. They cried out. God sent Moses. Some of, we've seen the movies. <laughs> Some of us have read the book. Um, gets Moses, gets the Israelites out and they go into the desert. They're traveling to the promised land for various reasons. It takes 40 years. But on the journey, God says something really surprising. He tells Moses to tell the people, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. Exodus 25, eight through nine. So what the tabernacle was, was was it was a tent-like structure that could travel, it was mobile, and it had incredible detail in in it. Uh, It goes on and on. The Ark of the Covenant, and I won't get too detailed in this, but the Ark of the Covenant was really at the center of it all, was that was, every time you said that, you were actually saying that's where the very presence of God dwelt. So it takes 15 chapters to like explain this. So if you've ever um, tried to read the Bible in one year and you use one of those plans, this is where you quit. <laughs> it, it, is, it is dry. It is a lot of information. It's complicated. And sometimes it can feel a little boring. But it's so awesome. Like what it's saying. And as you dig it and as you study that the piece, it's incredible. Now, during that whole f- chap, 15 chapters of narrative, uh, uh, sorry, of just detail, there's a narrative that pops up in the middle. And here's what happens. The people say mine. They have somebody make them a golden calf because they want to be like all the other nations that have gods that they can control. They can have them do what they want them to do. Instead of understanding that why they're doing that, the only God, the one and only God, the God above all others is saying, I'm going to live with you. And so the, the strings slip out of tune again and it doesn't work. But God enters his home anyway. Amazing. Uh, Verse 34 of 40, he says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Don't get lost on glory of the Lord. We're just saying the presence of God, who he is, the essence of who God is. But God is now dwelling with man. Now it's a little different though. Unfortunately, only Moses can really get close. Joshua gets in one time, but a few times, but but really nobody else gets to go very much near, very much near it, and it shows just how to, how out of tune that man has gotten. And so, third part is we fast forward 
400 years uh, approximately. And all of a sudden, man has an idea. This man is King David. And he says, man, why should God live like this? We can do better. Here's what he says, 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 2. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God, his presence, dwells, here's that word again, dwells, we're gonna see it a lot, dwells in a tent. So they build a temple. But here's the thing, David doesn't get to do it. God says, not you, I'm gonna let your son do it. And Solomon actually builds it. It takes him about seven years. When he tacks on his palace, the whole thing takes 20 years. And we see a similar description like the tabernacle when God moves in. So they get it done, they dedicate it. Here's what happens. Uh, 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11. And when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord, his presence filled the house of the Lord. Now the temple, that was a culmination of all this. And it meant it had so much meaning for the people of Israel. It was the center of the nation. It was the center of so many things. But guess what? They reached for the apple, essentially. They said mine. They started to follow after other gods. It says even before the temple is being is done, Solomon's already marrying more wives than God has said. He's he's accumulating more wealth than God ever wanted him to. And he's breaking commandments. Civil war breaks out. We see through the through the Old Testament as we keep reading and it has a sad ending in the, in the book. You ever see the book Ezekiel? In that book, God says, or, or Ezekiel says, God actually gets up and leaves the temple. He just walks out, he's done. And even later we find that the temple gets destroyed. It's devastated. And um, invaders come in, they take off the, all the stuff in the temple, they take the people away too. But later on, there's actually a couple of rebuilds. And we see one of them in the Old Testament. And then we see the last one is Herod right before somebody's born. And I'll tell you who that is in a minute. But here's the thing about these two temples. We never see God come and fill it with his presence, with his glory. He never dwells in these temples. In fact, God never steps foot in these temples until we see Jesus walking up the steps. And here's something he said when he was, he was near the temple. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> That's really provocative language when the temple means everything to people. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? Here we go. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, if we pay attention, there are two spectacular things that God is saying here, that, that Jesus is saying about himself. One He's the temple now, that God doesn't dwell in buildings. He dwells in Jesus. And you're like, wait a minute, where'd you get that? Well, I got it from another place too. Colossians actually says the fullness in Christ, the fullness of the deity, here's that word again, dwells. And more, this temple has a plan for how we keep going out of tune. So here's the plan. Is this perfect person, would live in tune his whole life. He would never have one string go out of tune. And instead of patting himself on the back, he hung on a cross and he died. And that death meant everything to us because what God did with that is he took his in tuneness and credited it to us as if we had been in tune all the time, even though we know we haven't and that we probably won't always stay in tune. He credits it to us. And then he rose from the dead. And then it says he ascended into heaven. Man, if we stopped right there, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing we've talked about. But there's more. Now realize, we've gone through Genesis, through Exodus, the second book of the Bible. We've trucked through all these history books in the Bible. We've gotten into the later prophets at the end of the, of the, of the Old Testament. And then we've gotten into New Testament with the Gospels. We've talked about Acts because that's where we're gonna talk about Acts in a minute. God came, came down. And then we're gonna talk about the, a little bit of the rest there where Paul starts to talk. So we know that in Acts, God all of a sudden fills the place where they're at. He dwells, now, but he dwells very differently. And here's how it is. And Paul talks about it in Corinthians. And this has huge implications for you, huge implications for me. We're gonna talk about those. But here's what Paul says. He's talking to the church in Corinth. 
And that's, this is in 1 Corinthians. So the church at Corinth, they were a new church, but they were, have, they were really struggling, do a lot of different areas, doing some things wrong. And Paul was trying to right the ship. And he started to talk about their identity, like who they actually were. And he says this about who they are. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells, there it is, dwells in you? That is amazing stuff. If we, if we stop and think back everything we've talked about up to this point. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And then he says again to reiterate in the same book in chapter six, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. We are not made for ourselves. God has found his dwelling place finally and it existed in Jesus and he sacrificed everything so it could exist in us. We are the temples. This is stunning. God dwells in man. He dwells in us. So again, we went a long way in a short period of time. But what does that all mean when we say, don't we know where the temples? There's three things. One, has everything to do with our identities today, who we are. We are the place where God dwells. And maybe you grew up with bad labels. Like you've got certain words in your head that describe you that you heard from people that just were out of tune. Or maybe you have good labels. Maybe you think too much of yourself, but here's the thing. You can't think enough of yourself in the context of God's story because you are the temple. You are a sacred space that God makes his home in. His perfection is our credit, even when we miss the mark. It's incredible. And number two, what do we do now that we're temples? Well, Pastor John, a couple weeks ago, showed us what it meant to live as a temple. And he read in Romans 12, one and two. So let's, in the context of we are God's temples, we are not made for ourselves. Let's go back and look at that scripture. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead for you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. That's temple language. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So it's no longer a mind mentality, but God has rescued us to say yours, God. And not just during worship music, but our whole walking around lives and even the way we think that it would bend towards yours. And when it bends towards yours, this scripture says, we begin to know what God wants us to do and what he wants us to be and, and what Paul is doing the whole time. And he's the author of Romans, author of Colossians. He's the author of Corinthians. He is telling us how to be the church, how to be the temples. So what does this mean for our worship experience? When we walk in here and we do this thing and we're singing, well, first of all, whatever way you worship, just know this, you are a profound expression towards God. You just are. You're created in his image and you're full of his glory. But second of all, whatever way you worship, whatever way that is, please know, man, God is looking for you to move towards him. So when we find ourselves in a difficult circumstance, and this is how worship operates with spiritual formation, like how we're growing, how we're becoming more what Romans just said, more given over to him, more of yours. We find ourselves in difficult circumstances. We find ourselves anxiety and grief and pain, fear, doubts, confusion, it can go on and on and on. That can begin to tell the story of life. Like this is what life is. And can I tell you that that's not what life is? God's got a story for you that he wants to tell. He is a healer, a redeemer, and he loves to take the brokenness and, and make it whole again. So instead, what we do in worship, we come here, we may feel some of those things, the doubt, the grief, the confusion, the hurt, the pain. But then all of a sudden, we start to sing a song that tells a different story that comes from God's story. I had some people write our, our worship team and was just thanking us for doing the song, Raise a Hallelujah. And they had had a tragedy on one side, the, the the wife had a tragedy that had happened and they were just getting over that before the next tragedy hit on his side. And so they were both going through it. And they said, that lyric, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, gave them so much courage. It brought peace that passes all understanding. 
And, and I hope that song does that for you. It does it for me. Do you feel far away? Well, there's a song here again, not for a minute that we sing, not for a minute, was I forsaken? Are you lost? And do you feel like you just have any place with God? Well, here's a song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found, was blind, but now I see. So we're in this season where we can't even be in the building. I mean, we can't even be here. Uh, it, it's, it's been a little while. And you might think, I can't wait to get back to worship. But can I say something right to you right now? That this building that we're in, that I'm in right now, is not the temple. It's the building that houses the temples, where the temples gather and worship. So you're sitting there right now in your living room or your bedroom or wherever you are and you're watching. Can I tell you, you're the temple. It's you. You're, you have, if you've crossed the line of faith, you have God's spirit dwelling in you right now. And temples are made for worship. And so we're gonna sing a song here in a minute. It's called Always Good. It's, it's, it's a great song. And it says some things that whatever you're going through right now, you can still say that God is good because God has a plan for you and God has your address. He knows what's going on and he wants to reach to it. So, but as we sing this song, can I encourage you? Maybe it's hard sometimes you're in the living room, like you might have your family by yourself and you might be thinking, I don't wanna sing out loud. Can I encourage you just to take a little step, even if it's not loud and form the words? Because as we form the words, they're forming our heart the way we think. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. And so can we begin to transform, like Romans said, with our worship? and give him the praise and the glory that's due him because it's his story, but he's included us in a massive way because he's, chose, he's chosen to dwell in us forever. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you. It's amazing that you tried so hard to dwell in us. And when Jesus came, you made it that you didn't just dwell with us, you dwelled inside of us. And you said, you never leave us, never forsake us. We thank you, God, because even in the storm, we're going to sing. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.